Well, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And as you're turning, I want to welcome those of you in Arlington and Moco, Loudoun, Prince William, as well as others online who are physically unable to be with us today. And shout out especially to brothers and sisters who used to sit among us and who are living in different places around the world right now for the spread of the gospel. It's really good to be together around God's word. I want to start by doing a simple, relaxing exercise all together. So on the count of three, I want to invite you to just take a deep breath. So this is not you're in a doctor's office and somebody's checking to make sure everything's okay. This is just a nice, relaxing, calming, breath in and out. Sound good? All right, who doesn't like a moment just to stop and take a good breath? So let's do it together. One, two, three, breathe in and out. Pretty simple, right? And pretty awesome at the same time. So here's what just happened. You just took into your body about 25 sextillion molecules of air. Sextillion. That's 25 with 21 zeros behind it. That's more molecules that just pass through your nose than all the grains of sand on all the world's beaches. Now those molecules were made up of many different elements, one of which is oxygen. It's about 20% of the molecules you just breathed in. Side note, thankfully you breathed in clean air. If it had been filled with smoke, for example, your body would have immediately rejected it. It would not have been relaxing. But thankfully it wasn't. And the oxygen you needed came into your body. Now here's how it got into you. Your brain sent a message to your diaphragm and ribs telling them to contract, increasing the size of your rib cage, enabling your lungs to expand, which then allowed air to rush in. The air went down your trachea into your lungs where it came into contact with hundreds of millions of miniature balloon-like projections called alveoli. They have alveolar walls that then brought those oxygen molecules in touch with red blood cells which comprise the transportation system for oxygen in your body. So you have about 20 trillion of these red blood cells. Your body is churning out about 2.5 million of them per second. That was another 2.5 mil and another. And each of these red blood cells contains about 270 million oxygen binding molecules of hemoglobin. Are you following this? These red blood cells picked up those oxygen molecules and carried them through your cardiovascular network, this massive collection of blood vessels that reaches every cell in your body. If we laid out those blood vessels in a straight line end to end, they would wrap around the entire world multiple times. And where did these red blood cells get the energy to get that oxygen throughout the body? your heart, which pumps an average of about 100,000 times a day. So in that one breath you took, your heart was the powerhouse that took that oxygen you inhaled and got it to every part of your body that needs it. All of that in just one breath. So let's take one more together now that you know what's happening. <laughs> Breathe in. And out. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? And all the more so when you realize this happens about 20,000 times a day without you even thinking about it. And just to point out the obvious, if it doesn't happen, even for just a few minutes, you won't make it through the day. Now, the reason I share all of this is because as important as oxygen is to your body, and I trust you know how important it is, 
I want to propose to you that the book I am holding in my hand right now is infinitely more important to your life. Amen. Amen. And I am concerned that you don't know how important it really is. I want to propose to you that this book has power to bring every part of your being to life in ways that oxygen could never do. And this book has power to sustain your life amidst everything you face in this world in ways that oxygen cannot do. And ultimately, one day, when your body loses the ability to take one more breath, and it will happen, it could happen at any moment for any one of us, this book has power to save your life beyond your breath. Amen. So I want to show you this. And this next step in our series on the beauty of faith in the book of James, starting in James 1.16. So look at it with me. And I, I want to encourage you, maybe to circle every time you see the word of God mentioned in this passage. So here we go, James 1.16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word, so there's the first time we see it, of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who were, looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Six times these verses talk about God's word or God's law. And did you see what God's word does? It does more than oxygen. Look back at verse 16, or 18, sorry. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. The word brings us forth. What does that mean? The language is literally, it brings us to life. And we see that same language in the New Testament, just a couple of chapters later in your Bible, turn with me to the right. You'll come to the very next book, 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, in the first chapter of his letter, uses this same phrase two times. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. That's the same language in the New Testament. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Later down in 1 Peter 1, 23, since you have been born again, there it is again, that same phrase, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, to the living and abiding word of God. For all flashes, flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Do you hear this language? God's word is living. It's abiding. It will abide forever. And it has power to give you new birth, to make you born again. And what is this word? It is the good news. So now, tie this with what we just saw in James chapter 1. This word is the good news that's able to bring you forth to life. Then in verse 21, this word is able to save your soul. Which begs the question, how, how does this word make this possible? 
How is this word able to save your soul and bring you to life and sustain your life? Well, I'm glad you asked. This word is the living and abiding word of God. So the same God who created your body and your heart and your lungs and your blood cells and your blood vessels, the same God who provides the oxygen for you to breathe, this same God has spoken to you and me. In this word, so big picture, God has told us who he is and how he created us and how he loves us. And God has told us how we can experience abundant life with him. And God has told us how we have all sinned against him and how the just judgment due our sin is death, eternal death. But think about it. Why has God told us this? Because God loves us and wants to save our souls from death. To save our souls from sin. God's told us in his word how he has sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. To rise from the dead in victory over sin and the grave. So that anyone who trusts in Jesus will be forgiven of their sin and restored to a relationship with God where we can experience New eternal life with him forever. Amen. This word has power to give new life in relationship with God, to bring us to life, to cause us to be born again, to save our souls from sin and death and sustain every facet of our life through every circumstance in life, now and forever. In other words, this word is infinitely more important to our lives than oxygen is to our bodies. And I'm concerned that many of us, and I, th I think I'm safe in saying most of us, are not getting the life we need from this word. And as a result, we are weak and frail in every facet of our lives, not just spiritually, but mentally and emotionally and relationally and even physically in some ways. And I feel safe saying most of us because, well, just personally, I include myself in this. I've been so convicted studying this passage this week personally and as part of the church in our day. Did you know that just a century or two ago, it would have been common for a regular churchgoer, so all the more so a pastor, but a regular, just everyday Christian to rise before dawn for extended time not just a quick devotional thought, extended time in private prayer and meditation on God's word. There would then be followed by family prayer and meditation on God's word in the morning. There would be followed by time set aside in the middle of the day for personal and or corporate, meaning with the whole church gathering together for prayer and meditation on God's word. There would then be followed by family prayer and meditation on God's word in the evening, before personal prayer and meditation on God's word before going to sleep. This was once the normal schedule for a Christian. Collective hours throughout the day in prayer and meditation on God's word. But not for us today. We almost can't fathom that schedule. Not amidst everything else going on in our lives, right? How do we imagine this kind of schedule with all that's going on in our lives, right? I mean, think about how is it possible from the moment we rise to the moment we go to bed to moments throughout the day to always be looking at God's word? We can't imagine. Well, wait a minute. 
Can we imagine having something that we look at first thing in the morning and right before we go to bed and collective hours of our day in between? I think we can. Did you know that the average American spends five hours and 24 minutes a day on their mobile device, phone, tablet. From the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed and everywhere in between. Did you know that we check our phones on average 96 times a day or once every 10 minutes? Brothers and sisters, we are breathing in the air of this world all day long on our phones. We've actually disciplined ourselves to do so, to always be looking, scrolling, typing, reading, sending, listening. To use the illustration from earlier, we're breathing in smoke all day long. And you can tell in the quality of our spiritual lives in our mental and emotional states, in our relationships, and in some ways even our physical conditions. And in this moment, in this text, on this day, right now, God is calling you and me to make a radical change to reorient our lives around this word so that we can actually live. We are not living like we could. I'm not living like I could. And God loves us so much. He wants us to experience life if we'll listen to what he's saying. So here's what God is saying right now through his word, in this moment about the place of his word in our lives, God is saying right now to us, so maybe write this down, and this is coming straight from him, and I hope to show you it is. God is saying to us right now, receive my word humbly and wholeheartedly. How about verse 19? Let every person, that pretty much covers all of us, be quick to hear. The, the language is literally let every person hurry up and listen and be quiet, slow to speak and slow to anger. These are all postures of humility. And there's actually some confusion about whether James is talking generally here about all of life, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, in all of life, or specifically when we approach God's word. And based on the whole Bible, we know it's ultimately both. And God instructs us, yes, to live like this all the time. Just think about the Proverbs. The whole book starts by saying, Proverbs 1, 5, let the wise hear and increase in learning, the one who understands obtain guidance. In contrast, Proverbs 18, 2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Read 90% of social media today. Wisdom starts with listening to understand, not expressing your opinion. Proverbs 17, 27. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge. He who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Restrain his word. What a word we need to hear in a culture that says a thought means we need to communicate that thought. If I have a thought, I need to post it. If I have a thought, I need to send it. If I have a thought, I need to text it. If I have a thought, I need to say it. No, whoever restrains his words has knowledge. And he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Proverbs 14, 29. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding. He who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Do people know you as a listener? 
who's always seeking to understand and who is slow to anger. I will not ask for a show of hands when it comes to who struggles with listening and who struggles with anger. But let's all hear God speaking to all of us today, calling us to a different way to live, knowing that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Anger does not produce a life that accords with a right relationship with God and with others. God is saying to us, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. The language there is like taking off garments in order to put on something totally different. And here's the deal. This is how we should be in our communication with anyone. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. How much more so than in our communication with God? Quick to hear what God has to say. God, I want to listen all day long to what you have to say. This is our posture toward others. More importantly, our posture toward God. So James writes, receive with meekness, with humility, the implanted word, which is able, as we've talked about, to save your souls. And this word implanted is so good because for all those who've been brought to life by this word, who've been born again by the power of this word, God's word is now planted inside of you. Now this is where I want to show you two quick verses in the Old Testament. So if you have a Bible, turn with me back to Jeremiah chapter 31. And if these verses are not underlined in your Bible, they need to be. And and by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we would love to get you one. So if you don't have a Bible, just turn to somebody around you or go to the lobby as soon as we're finished today and say, hey, can you help me get a Bible and... If, if they won't help you, then tell them they have a problem. And, <laughs> or maybe if they're looking for a Bible, be like, okay, well, well, let's look and just keep going until you find somebody who has a Bible. And if they won't help you get a Bible, then tell them they have a problem and then just move on until you find. Anyway, just we would love to get you a Bible. But Jeremiah 31, let me set the context here. Back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah was speaking to God's people about their struggles to obey God's law. And God gave them a promise of what would happen in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, through Jesus. So look with me at Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31. God says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So this is what's going to happen in the New Testament with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For in this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Did you hear that? God says, my word's not just going to be outside my people. It's going to be inside them, within them. I'm going to write it on their hearts. So implanted in you. Then one more place. So take a right in your Bible and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. So just turn over a few pages to Ezekiel chapter 36. This is another passage you need to have underlined specifically about the relationship between our hearts and God's word and God's spirit. The imagery here is breathtaking. Ezekiel chapter 36, look at verse 24. God says, talking about the new covenant, I'm going to take you from the nations. I'm going to gather you from all the countries. I'm going to bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. From your idols, I will cleanse you. It's talking about how God's going to forgive us of our sin. And that's where, this is where most or a lot of followers of Jesus stop. I'm forgiven of my sin through Jesus. But that's not The end of the story. Like, yes, praise God, we're forgiven of our sin, but then listen to this. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I'll remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. 
and be careful to obey my role, my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. You see the language here. God's promising in the new covenant, this relationship we have through Jesus. This is what has happened to everybody who's placed your faith in Jesus. God has not just forgiven you of, his, of your sin. He has filled you with his spirit. You have a whole new heart. You have all, that's what it means to be born again. And by his spirit, he causes us from the inside out to walk in his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. This is what James means by the implanted word. You have the word of God in you, the written on your heart. You have the spirit of God in you to enable you to obey. So to use our illustration from earlier, just like you have a physical heart that needs oxygen to work, you have, Christian, you have a spiritual heart that needs God's word to work. Your heart, your life cannot work without God's word pumping through it all the time. Not just a little word from God for the day. All the time, pumping through your life. So humbly and wholeheartedly, it's written on your heart to receive it all day long, in the morning, in the evening, and in your moments in between. Receive this word and experience life. This is the Christian life. And when we live like this, we'll experience what it means to be the people of God, to walk with God and love relationship with him. Christian, don't settle for anything less than this. Amen. Don't settle for being forgiven of your sin and breathing in smoke all day long and starving your heart from what you most need, the word of God and the spirit of God pumping through your entire being. So let's receive God's word humbly and wholeheartedly. Then, so listen to what God is saying to us right now. Receive my word humbly and wholeheartedly and remember my word intentionally and continually. Intentionally and continually. So we're I'm going to talk in just a moment about this clear command to be doers of the word. But look with me at the illustration James uses in this passage about a guy who looks at himself in a mirror and walks away and at once forgets what he was like. Who gets up in the morning, stands in front of a mirror, then walks away and thinks, I wonder what I look like? It's absurd. And keep in mind, in that day, they didn't have mirrors made of glass like we do. They were made of metal. Which meant you spent all this time like polishing it, only to look at yourself and then walk away and forget what you look like. He's saying, don't do that with God's word. But it's possible, right? It's possible to open God's word, to read it, and a few hours later, totally forget what you read. Honestly, we can forget within a few minutes. But watch the contrast here. But, but, the one who looks into the perfect law, and this is so good, the way looks is used here, like the word for looks intently, looks here, it's, it's like stooping down to look closely, intentionally at something. I was trying to think of an illustration. I think about when I was buying Heather's wedding ring. So, High school guys, middle school guys, elementary school guys, start saving now. <laughs> it's gonna cost you the farm. And you're gonna get a lesson that day in cut, clarity, color, and carrot. And you're gonna think all these diamonds look the same, but they're not the same. And there's a different price tag that goes with each of them based on those factors. And you're going to have somebody pick it up and turn it on an angle and be like, do you see that? And you're going to be like, I don't really see it. But yes, I see it, of course. No, that's why it's that much more. And, but anyway, you, <laughs> there's a lot of memories coming back from that moment. Um, <laughs> but you're going to look at this diamond and that diamond from every angle possible. And you're going to turn it around. James says, do that with the word. Amen. Don't just... Don't just you're looking into the perfect law. Don't just like read it to get through it. 
What are you doing? Checking off a box? What, what are you doing? It's not life. Stop and study it. Gaze on it. Look at it from every angle. One translation of this word, look, is to look with penetrating absorption. I love that. Absorb it. And persevere in this. Like continue doing it. Don't be content with just a little word from God to move on in your day from. No, look at it and keep looking at it all day long so you don't forget it, so you remember it. This is what God told his people back in Deuteronomy. Like from the very beginning of his people. Turn with me. So this is one other place in the Old Testament that, at least for today, you need underlined in your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter six. It's the fifth book in the Bible, so just kind of go to the, near the beginning of the Bible. Deuteronomy, and that word, Deuteronomy, actually means second law. So it's God recounting his law among his people before they go into the promised land. So he's telling them to remember his law. That's the whole book. It's what it's about. And this is one of the most important passages in all the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four. It's called the Shema. And the reason it's called that is because the first word here, that's Shema. So just a little Hebrew lesson today. Uh, Shema, it's a beautiful Hebrew word that means, it's like one word that means to hear and obey in one word. So we got two words, hear and obey. They got one word. So hear and obey. Like Let this change your life. So hear this. O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Pointer wishes we could just stop there and camp out. Like, do you realize you are created to experience a relationship with the Lord God of the universe that's marked by love? Amen. This is what you're made for. And how do you experience this love relationship with God? Well, look at verse six. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. It sounds like he's talking about a cell phone, but no, he's talking about the word of God. And when the Lord your God, now follow this, brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of good things you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant. And when you eat and are full, when you're enjoying all my blessing, take care, lest you what? Forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Is that possible? Is it possible to experience all the blessings of God and forget God? Absolutely, it's possible. It's probable. That's why God's telling his people this before they go into the promised land. And so what is the antidote to keep you from forgetting? These words shall be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them all the time. When you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise, all the time. Now listen, turn over just two chapters to Deuteronomy chapter eight. Look at what happens in verse 11. When he warns them, take care lest you forget the Lord, your God, by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I commanded you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God. It's he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today, you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Are you hearing this? Don't forget God's word. 
Don't go on with the busyness of your life, enjoying the blessings of God in your life, and forget the word of God. It will lead to destruction for you in ways you could never fathom, in ways you might not even realize. So lodge this word in your heart and your mind so that it's always before you. You know what that's like with your phone. It's always near you. You're always looking at it. Be like that with the word of God. And just to remind her at this point, God's word is available on these devices. So, so we have collective hours from this device that we have the word with us all the time. So now, now think about this practically. All right, a clear call from God. Remember my word intentionally and continually. So what is the best way to remember God's word? And this is not a trick question. The best way to remember God's word is to memorize God's word. I put it on your mind and where it stays there. Now I know at this point, some people say, well, I just can't memorize well. And I've mentioned this before. There's, there's no question that different people have different capacities to memorize. But I've mentioned this before. What, what if I told you that I would give you $1,000 for every verse you could memorize between now and this time tomorrow? I'm thinking you'd learn <laughs> to memorize. Like, Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35, boom, <laughs> thousand bucks. So the question is not, can you memorize? The question is, what's more important to you, God's word or money? What's more important? God's word or, or money to you? Memorize verses, paragraphs, chapters, books. I'll never forget the first time I heard someone quote a chapter as part of his learning a book in the Bible. It was like, whoa, just flowing from that person. It changed my life. He actually believes this is a treasure. It's worth hiding. And if that sounds extreme to us, well, I would just point us to some of our Muslim friends and neighbors and coworkers who revere their book so much that they train their children to memorize the Quran before they graduate high school. And not just to memorize the whole thing, but to memorize it in Arabic, in the original language it was written in. What would it look like to have as the focus of our children's ministry memorizing the New Testament in Greek? And once we got that done, move on to the Old Testament in Hebrew. You say, that's crazy. Well, if they're that committed to learning the words of a false God, then what does this say about you and I who claim to have the words of the one and only true God? Why does it sound extreme to us? Memorize verses, paragraphs, chapters, books? Like, no, this is what Christians do. Why? Because they, we love the Word of God. It's written on our hearts. We want to walk with God. It's so much more important to us than all the drivel of this world. So let's help each other remember God's Word intentionally and continually. If you're the head of your household, take responsibility for leading your household to memorize the Word. In church groups, let's memorize the Word together. If we're not intentional about this, then we'll come together. Hear a sermon on Sunday, go to Bible study, maybe even read our Bible in the morning. And it'll be fine, 
But by the time we go to bed that night, we'll have forgotten most of it. This is the way our minds work. It's what God's telling us, unless we keep looking at it intentionally and continually. And we obey it. So God is saying to us today, receive my word humbly, wholeheartedly. Remember my word intentionally and continually. And obey my word immediately and gladly. If you just hear it, you're deceiving yourself. Did you catch that? Like James just said, it's possible to come to church every single Sunday and listen and take notes and be completely deceived. It's possible, dangerously possible, to come in here, listen to a sermon, and think, man, I needed that. And then walk away, nothing changes. We can come back the next week, man, I needed that sermon, that was good. There's a lot of conviction. And then walk away and nothing changes. I actually can kind of think that's Christianity. I was really convicted by that. Man, that was a good one. We're deceived. We're totally deceived. And we can do the same thing with reading the Bible in our individual lives. We can, you can read the Bible every single day and live a totally deceived life. Which is why James 1.22 says what it does. It's maybe the theme verse of the entire book of James. Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Then he gets to verse 25. And he says, but the one who looks, as we've talked about, into God's law, God's perfect law, the law of liberty, I love that. The word that brings freedom to live and is not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Jesus says the exact same thing. Listen to his language, Matthew chapter seven, verse 21. This is near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare, them to their, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Do you hear this? Jesus just said many, not a few, many people will be shocked to stand before Jesus one day and hear him say, I never knew you. Away from me, people who called Jesus Lord, but did not obey the law of God. They didn't do it. We're gonna talk about this more when we get to James chapter two, when we see the relationship between faith and works, because this is not Jesus or James saying we have to work to earn our salvation. But this is Jesus and James saying, those who truly know Jesus actually obey Jesus. Amen. And listen to what Jesus says next. So at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount, this is how it closes, about how obedience to the word is foundational to your life. He says, verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, hears the word and does the word, will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Did you notice the difference between those who withstand the storms of life and those who cave when the storms of life come? Amen. Did you notice they both hear the words of Jesus? The difference is one group does the word and the other group stops with hearing. So how are you doing? Because there's a sense in which Satan would delight in you hearing this sermon and a variety of other sermons, good sermons, even resolving to read your Bible more as long as you don't do anything with it. Because then you'll just get used to 
our religion that consists of hearing and not doing, and you will live totally deceived. Deceived means you think you're getting it, but you're totally missing the point. Obey God's word immediately. When God's word says to do something, do it then. Not later, not when you get, get around to it, not when it gets easy. Do it immediately. I would just ask, is there something, are there things that you know God has been calling you to do for a while now and you've been hesitant to do it for whatever reason? Hear God saying to you right now, it's time to do it. Now, immediately, and gladly. Remember, this is the law of liberty. Oh, there it is. Law of liberty. The law of freedom. This is experiencing the life God's made you to live. Knowing that when you hear this word and obey it, you will be blessed in your doing. That word means happy. It's the same word we see in Psalm 1. Blessed, happy, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates when? Day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does, he prospers. Obviously, that does not mean that everything will be easy. Everything will always go well around you. Remember the trials of various kinds that we saw earlier in James 1? Which is why Jesus' words in Matthew 7 are so important. Because when the trials of life come, and they will come, storms if you're living your life breathing in the air of this world all day, you'll collapse when the trials come. They can't hold you up. This drivel all day long will not be able to hold you up. But when you're receiving God's word humbly, wholeheartedly, you're remembering it intentionally and continually, obeying it immediately and gladly, you'll have the life of God pumping through every fabric of your being. You'll be able to stand. You'll be able to stand. And when, just think about it, when the ultimate trial comes and your breath is no more, all the drivel you spent hours on is not going to do anything for you. It's going to fall apart. It's going to be totally empty. What will matter on that day? The word that brought you to life. The word that's able to save your soul. That's what you want to have spent hours pouring into your heart and mind. So, Here's how I want to close today, because I really believe God is calling all of us, including myself, to a radical reorientation of our lives around his word. It's totally against the grain of the way we're programmed and we've learned to live in this culture. So, so some of you have never received God's word. You've, you've not been born again through this word. And so the next couple of minutes, as we pray and reflect, I want to invite you to let this be the moment. Let today be the day when you are brought forth to life through believing in God's word. That's the invitation for you today. God has brought you to this moment because God loves you. God wants a relationship with you. He sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for you. So I want to invite you as we pray and reflect in a minute just to say, I believe your word. Today, I, want, I, want, I need you to give me life. Jesus, I need you to forgive me of my sin and to fill me with your spirit, to give me new heart, causing me to be born again today. And that's a prayer God will answer. When you trust in him, I invite you to do that today. And for all who have, so for all who've been brought forth by the word of truth, who've been born again through the living and abiding word of God, what I want to invite you to do in the next couple of minutes is just between you and God to consider what is God calling you personally, specifically, 
practically to do to orient your life around breathing in this word. So I want to encourage you. In a sense, I want to challenge you to, in these couple minutes, identify one, two, three practical steps God is calling you to take this week, and not in the future, not just generally, but specifically and right now, to reorient your life around receiving, remembering, and obeying His Word. So I wanna give you a minute to reflect on this before God, maybe to write this down, and then I or one of our other location pastors will lead us in prayer. That God will help us not just to hear what he's saying, but to do it and in doing it to live. God's calling us to live. So spend some time reflecting on this question now and then we'll pray all together. you to bow your heads with me unless you're still writing or just don't let me interrupt anything that you're still doing personally just between you and the Lord. I want to begin to lead us all though in, in prayer together. God, we are so thankful for how you speak to us. We shudder to think of where we would be without your word. We would, we would not know how we could be saved from our sins. We would not be in relationship with you. And we would be walking through this world not knowing what to do, just trying to find our way in the dark without the light of your word. When we face trials and storms, we would not have a rock to stand on. We would just be carried, driven by the wind back and forth in ways that we begin to believe lies and we wouldn't have a place to stand. God, we praise you for your word, the rock that it is, the place we can stand. We praise you for your promises to us. We praise you for your commands to us, for your instructions to us. They're life to us. We praise you for loving us enough to speak to us and all the more so for planting this word on our hearts and putting your spirit inside of us. Yes, God, we want to experience life through your word and your spirit in us. So help us, we pray. We know, God, we are going totally against the grain of this world. And the way we are programmed to live in this world in so many ways, in the culture around us, in the water we swim in, Every day, God, please transform us. Help us to come out and be separate, to live different. That we might actually live. God, I pray over every single person in this room. I pray for those who are trusting in you today to bring life to their souls. Pray that they would know the wonder and significance of what it means today for the first time to be in relationship with you through faith in Jesus. I pray that your word that's been planted for the first time in their hearts today would bear fruit for all of eternity to your glory and their good. We pray for all of us who have your word in our hearts. God, help us to do what you've just told us to do in all the ways that plays out in our lives by the power of your spirit in us, help us to do this and in the process to experience what it means to be your people with you as our God. Help us to live. We pray this together in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen.